Welcome to the Human Element Show with Brian Fisher. The abortion debate in America is primarily a struggle between good and evil, and sometimes Christians choose willingly to side with evil. That is the topic of today's show. Hello and welcome to the Human Element Show, where we explore news, current events, and ideas through the lens of a pro-life worldview. And today we are going to talk about something that has been in the news, but has gotten virtually no coverage, either in the Christian area or in the mainstream media. And it is a fact, it is a story that requires us to explore our own convictions in light of our Christianity with a very sober mind. Let me let me point you to an event that happened recently. An Episcopal priest was recently appointed leader of the National Abortion Federation. I'm going to say that again. An Episcopal priest was recently appointed the leader of an organization called the National Abortion Federation. Catherine Ragsdale, an Episcopal priest and former president and dean of the Episcopal Divinity School and vicar of St. David's Episcopal Church in Massachusetts, is currently the interim president of NAF, the National Abortion Federation. What is the National Abortion Federation? Glad you asked. It describes itself as a, quote, professional association of abortion providers, end quote, meaning that the NAF is a club for men and women who profit from killing children through abortion. Thanks to the undercover investigation and the work of David DeLayden, a name who should be familiar to you, and the Center for Medical Progress, we know that the NAF, the National Abortion Federation, holds an annual conference where presenters meet and gather and attend seminars and workshops to talk about furthering their murderous craft and where, on record, presenters joke about things like getting the heads stuck of babies in the birth canal when they're trying to abort them, eyeballs falling into their laps, and wishing they could send aborted children home with mothers in gift bags so that they do not have to deal with the waste disposal headaches. Those comments were made on video. You can see them at the Center for Medical Progress's website. And this is the National Abortion Federation, of which the new president, an interim leader, is an Episcopal priest. The National Abortion Federation so wanted this information, David DeLayden's videos, to remain inside their abortion club that they obtained a gag order against DeLayden in an attempt to bar him from releasing footage captured at their event. That's shocking. The NAF touts their membership of individual abortionists, Planned Parenthood affiliates, and private clinics. And after 23 years, NAF's previous president, Vicky Saporta, finally retired. That left the door open for a new leader, and that new leader is an Episcopal priest. When I consider the image of a clergy member heading a group like the National Abortion Federation, I think of the image of Lucifer proclaiming, I will not serve. We'll break down the announcement about Ragsdale's appointment in the National Abortion, Abortion Federation's own words. So I'm going to read, read to you from a press release that the National Abortion Federation released related to the appointment of their new interim president and CEO. Title of the press release, The Very Reverend, Very Reverend, Catherine Ragsdale named the NAF interim president and CEO. Today, the National Abortion Federation Board of Directors announced the hiring of the Very Reverend Catherine Hancock Ragsdale as interim president and CEO of National Abortion Federation in the NAF Hotline Fund, effective immediately. Today's announcement comes amid one of the most hostile environments for abortion access and abortion providers in decades, and the interim president and CEO will play a crucial role in supporting abortion providers and patients throughout the Americas. Reverend Ragsdale is an Episcopal priest with a proven commitment to NAF's mission of ensuring safe, legal, and accessible abortion care, as well as the fundamental principles of justice and equity that underlie that mission. Now, we're going to spend some time on the show today breaking down that paragraph because in it are several things that we need to be very careful to understand as pro-lifers. Let me first 
drop back to a 30,000 foot view. A couple shows ago, we talked about Planned Parenthood's new president. Planned Parenthood's new president is a medical doctor. Do you remember that? She is a college university educated, medical school educated MD who is now the head of Planned Parenthood. You now have an Episcopal priest, the head of the National Abortion Federation. Folks, this is not an accident. There are very strategic reasons why the abortion industry puts the people in power that they do. First of all, both of these leaders are women. That's on purpose. Second of all, one is a medical professional and one is a religious leader. That is on purpose. I've talked about on this show for months that the abortion industry is continuing to pummel the American public with the idea that there's nothing wrong with abortion, that it is part of health care, that it should be normalized, that we should stop the debate, that anybody who holds to a pro-life position is moronic. These are the types of arguments that the abortion industry continues to make. Keeping in mind, folks, that abortion is the leading cause of death in our country. One million children murdered every year in the womb here in America. And the abortion industry is attempting, through a wide variety of very, very shrewd marketing tactics and political ploys, to make sure you and I feel that we begin to question our pro-life convictions because they want abortion normalized. They want the American public to view abortion the same way we view getting a tooth pulled. That's what they're after. And so they stand up a female doctor as the head of Planned Parenthood, and they stand up a female religious leader as the head of the National Abortion Federation. These are not by accident. Let's carefully now look at the statement that was made by the National Abortion Federation regarding the appointment of its interim president and CEO, the very Reverend Catherine Ragsdale. I'm going to read it again. Today, the NAF Board of Directors announced the hiring of the very Reverend Catherine Hancock Ragsdale as the interim president and CEO of NAF and the NAF Hotline Fund, effective immediately. Today's announcement comes amid one of the most hostile environments for abortion access and abortion providers in decades, and the interim president and CEO will play a crucial role in supporting abortion providers and patients throughout the Americas. Reverend Ragsdale is an Episcopal priest with a proven commitment to the mission of ensuring safe, legal, and accessible abortion care, as well as to the fundamental principles of justice and equity that underlie that mission. It's that last sentence that we need to spend some time on. Reverend Ragsdale is an Episcopal priest. Okay, why are they making sure that we know that she is very reverend and that she is Episcopal priest? Well, because they are attempting to undermine the theological underpinnings of the pro-life ethic. In essence, what the NIF is saying is, look, we know there are Christians that find abortion wrong, but here is a Christian leader with a sterling resume who is supporting abortion rights. Hmm, one of you is wrong. Don't miss this. The abortion industry is very careful to tackle all seven spheres of influence in American society, and the church is one of their primary targets. They are standing up a female religious leader on purpose, making sure that the entire world knows that she is a member of the clergy because they are attempting to erode the pro-life ethic which is ultimately grounded in the Christian faith. It's calculated. Understand the depth of evil when an organization committed to abortion rights soils the name of Jesus Christ by standing up somebody who supposedly claims Christ as their Lord, as the leader of an organization which promotes the wanton slaughter of American children. If you're not angry by this point, check your pulse, because this appointment is an offense to the gospel, is an offense to Christian everywhere, and is offense to the church, the true church of people who genuinely follow Jesus Christ. If every baby conceived in the womb is made in the image of God, handcrafted by our creator, divine works of art, uniquely created with unlimited value and unlimited potential, then why is it that the NAF 
would promote and prop up somebody who supposedly holds to that same theological worldview. I doubt she does, but supposedly holds to it. Well, again, they're trying to normalize abortion even in the church. This is a direct attack on Christianity. It cannot be determined otherwise. Reverend Ragsdale is an Episcopal priest with a proven commitment to NAF's mission of ensuring, watch this, safe, legal, and accessible abortion care. Now, of course, what is missing in 99.9999999% of abortion language is what abortion actually is. So, if we define abortion as the unjust killing of a preborn human being, we would rewrite that sentence by saying, Reverend Ragsdale is an Episcopal priest with a proven commitment to NAF's mission of ensuring safe, legal, and accessible slaughtering of a million preborn children a year. But it's trumped up in euphemism and language, abortion care. Well, of course, we're going to look at these three words. NAF's mission is to ensure safe, legal, and accessible abortion care. Safe for whom? Remember, the essence of the pro-life ethic, grounded in Christianity, but fully and utterly supported by philosophy and ethics and morality, is that the zygote has the same value as the adult. That a baby in the womb has the exact same moral, medical, ethical, theological value as you and I do. That, that's the point. And that, although this culture attempts to discriminate against preborn children by saying, well, they're worth less because they're in the womb. They're worth less because they're not as developed. They're worth less because they're smaller. All of those filters are fabricated and ambiguous by design, and they're designed to devalue a class of human beings. No different than discriminating against a class of human beings because of race or nationality or gender. They're just fancier terms that our culture for some reason accepts even though on the whole we reject discriminating against people groups based on race or nationality or gender. In the case of the preborn child, a Christian pro-lifer says that baby in the womb has the exact same moral standing as a baby or a child or an adult outside the womb. Therefore, when NAF claims that their mission is to ensure that abortions are safe, what does that mean? That phrase in and of itself, ladies and gentlemen, is a discriminatory statement because it simply ignores the safety of the human being in the womb by design. Raise your hand if you've heard of abortions being safe, legal, and rare, right? That was the mantra of the abortion industry for the first 20 or 30 years after the legalization of abortion. Now, they've changed the rare because that has been utterly deceitful. 60 million preborn children have been murdered in this country since 1973, so we can hardly say that it's been rare. But the abortion industry is still committed to safety? I think we need to stop as pro-lifers and assess our churches and our political institutions, primarily those who claim to be pro-life, and say, what does it mean when we buy the lie that we want abortions to occur in safety? There is no such thing as a safe abortion. Every abortion, by definition, is unsafe. It is fatal to the child who has the same moral standing and value as the mother. <gasps> Whoops, I said it. The baby has the same moral, ethical, theological value as the mother. By the way, it's not safe for mom either. Ask the millions of women who have suffered in silence because of an abortion decision they made at some point earlier in their lives. The physical, emotional, spiritual destruction of a mom is well documented, well researched, and unbelievably prominent in our culture. But abortion is primarily unsafe because the child perishes. Legal. NAF's mission now headed up by interim president, the very Reverend Catherine Ragsdale, is to make sure that abortion stays legal. We've talked about this at length in our show, but why is abortion legal in the first place? Well, it's because the Supreme Court legalized it in 1973 based on the Roe v. Wade case and the Doe v. Bolton case. Roe v. Wade, of course, was a Dallas-based case. 
striking down abortion protection laws, meaning protecting children. There were various laws in most states protecting the lives of children from abortion. Those were all struck down by a rogue Supreme Court that made a decision acknowledging they didn't even know when human life began. Should abortion be legal? This is a subject of much debate in our current political environment because if you've not been under a rock, you're aware that the shift in the Supreme Court is bringing up all sorts of conversations about whether or not Roe v. Wade will be overturned and how that might happen and when that might happen. And I won't delve into that today, but the reality is the opportunity to unwind Roe is greater now than it certainly has been since 1973. I think we would all agree with that. Whether or not it happens and how it happens, those are questions for another day. Keep in mind, if Roe v. Wade does get unwound at some point, where do those abortion rights go back to? Where does the legality of abortion go back to? Well, it goes back to the states. So it's not like abortion will become illegal in 50 states if Roe v. Wade becomes unwound. It simply goes back to the states to decide what they want to do. And I can promise you, I know, that the abortion industry is already strategizing on how to promote state abortion rights as aggressively as possible. And if you live in a state like California or New York, you're going to have abortion legalized in your state probably up till the 40th week easily. If you live in a state like Mississippi or Texas, you will have a battle on your hands where your state will attempt to make abortion illegal again, if Roe is ever undone. But the question is whether or not the Supreme Court is God. Oftentimes, the abortion industry will say, it's legal, the Supreme Court settled it, it's settled law, we're not going to discuss it. Well, Dred Scott was settled law. The Supreme Court also ruled that the black man was not worth as much as the white man. So is the Supreme Court God? Are they right every time? Do they get it perfect? The answer is absolutely not. In those two decisions, Roe v. Wade and Dred Scott are arguably the two worst decisions the Supreme Court has ever made in its history in America. So while the NAF claims that their new president, interim president, is assigned the duty of making sure that abortion rights are safe, legal, and accessible, no longer rare, accessible, all accessible, we need to ask ourselves, really, is it safe, and why is it legal, and what can we do to make it illegal? This last piece of that sentence, accessible abortion care. Folks, watch this carefully. I believe the abortion industry is moving as aggressively as it can to telemedicine. Telemedicine is receiving medical care over the phone, over social media, over chat, over FaceTime, over video, meaning not physically walking into a clinic, a medical clinic. So you might be on a health plan now where you have the option to download an app onto your smartphone and you can call up a doctor on the phone, and if you have the flu or a cold or something that's fairly easy to diagnose, that doctor, without after physically seeing you, can prescribe medicine and a diagnosis and a prescription, and you can get treated without ever leaving your home. Telemedicine. And various areas of medicine are moving in this direction for lots of different reasons, but folks, the abortion industry is moving very aggressively to telemedicine. Abortion access, we're not talking about necessarily the abortion clinic down the street from your house that's killing children on a Saturday morning. We're talking about the abortion industry marketing to women, giving them some modicum of quote unquote medical care through their smartphone, having an abortion pill shipped to their house, having the woman abort the child in the toilet, and never ever actually physically see a doctor. That is where the abortion industry is attempting to move. Why? Why is abortion access moving to a abortion telemedicine model? Well, because they know that Roe is under fire and they know that states are becoming increasingly aggressive about restricting abortion access. And so the abortion telemedicine industry is highly profitable and it skips a bunch of steps. It's hard to regulate. There are women now that are getting abortion pills from Hong Kong and China getting sent to them in the mail. They can do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of diagnoses over the phone or over a FaceTime app, a video chat. It saves them a ton of money and overhead. And they get to skip a lot of regulations. Why wouldn't they move? to telemedicine abortions. 
Are we prepared to deal with that? Folks, we have to ask ourselves whether or not we consider an abortion pill to be the same moral evil as a surgical abortion. If you've ever watched a video of a surgical abortion, it is gruesome, it is brutal, it is evil. And it's difficult to watch an abortion pill video, right? Because that occurs very early in the gestation period, and it's a two-stage pill, and it doesn't have the same emotional connotation as watching a 38-week child being ripped limb from limb in the womb. But may I submit to you that a chemical abortion, abortion by pill, has the same moral value, is the same moral evil as a surgical abortion. It's the same act. It's the killing of an innocent pre-born human being. Do we feel that? Does it weigh on us the same? Do we react as viscerally to a chemical abortion? By the way, if you move to telemedicine abortions, you don't even get sidewalk counselors involved anymore or protesters at abortion clinics. You have no opportunity to intervene with a woman who is going through a private abortion in her own home unless you're online intercepting that work, which is what Human Coalition does, the organization that I serve. But it's very difficult. So watch the news, watch the abortion sites. They're not really being quiet about it. There have been several publications, several articles, even in the last few months about the abortion industry saying it's moving to telemedicine to increase abortion access, which our Episcopal priest, priest in this article is trumpeting, supposedly under the banner of Christianity. Lastly, let's take a look at this last phrase in the National Abortion Federation's article, their press release announcing the very Reverend Catherine Ragsdale as their new interim president and CEO. Reverend Ragsdale is an Episcopal priest with a proven commitment to NAF's mission of ensuring safe, legal, and accessible abortion care, as well as to the fundamental principles of justice and equity that underlie that mission. Whoa! Justice and equity. Remember what we said at the top of the show, Planned Parenthood appointing a medical doctor, NAF appointing an Episcopal priest, a religious leader. Very, very intentional. And you continue to see this type of language coming from the abortion industry. It is just and equal for women to have unfettered rights to abortion access. Why are they using that language? Why are they using that language? Well, what is justice? Justice is disciplining the oppressor and rescuing the oppressed. What are they claiming? They're claiming that Reverend Ragsdale is now responsible for making sure that women have access to justice, equal rights, the ability to control their own bodies, quote unquote, the ability to be treated equally as men, and that requires the right to kill their children. Is that just? What about the term equity? Equity. Equal. Same basic argument. Women cannot be equal to men unless they have unencumbered abortion rights. There's a lot packed into this one press release, folks, and as we explore news and events and cultural ideas from a pro-life worldview, it's very, very important that we don't let these sort of things slip by without fully investigating them through the lens of our Christian pro-life worldview. There's a lot of evil going on here just in this one paragraph. A religious leader, a supposed Christian leader, I think we have caused to doubt her faith, is appointed as the head of one of the loudest and most vehement abortion rights organizations in the country, and they are claiming that not only is that a religious position, thus trying to strike at the root of the Christian pro-life ethic, but that the Reverend Ragsdale is actually a warrior for justice and women's equality. Now, the obvious question is, what about the equality and justice for the 30 million females who have been aborted in the womb since 1973 here in America? There's a lot more to this story. I find her as a figure to be interesting. Let me continue. Through her career, the Reverend Ragsdale has been outspoken about abortion rights. LGBTQ equality and public policy issues affecting women and families. She has testified before the U.S. Congress 
as well as numerous state legislators about the importance of abortion access and was featured speaker at the 2004 March for Women's Lives in Washington, D.C. Reverend Ragsdale served for 17 years on the National Board of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice as chair. She led the coalition through a change of its name, mission, and organizational structure. During that time, the coalition's budget, staff, and office space more than doubled in size. Yippee. Ragsdale is no stranger to the world of abortion, and her credential as someone who can increase revenue no doubt gave her a leg up at the NAF fundraising, whose members are highly focused on the big business aspect of abortion. Reverend Ragsdale said, quote, the work the NAF and their members do to secure and expand abortion access every day is at the heart of my own values and commitment. Throughout my career, I have preached preached, notice that word, that abortion is a blessing. Abortion is a blessing and that providers are modern day saints and heroes and I have seen firsthand how access to abortion can improve the lives and health of women and their families. It is an honor to join an organization I have long admired and be able to support abortion providers during such a critical time, unquote. Wow, did you catch the religious Christian language in her speech? She says, I have preached that abortion is a blessing and that providers are modern-day saints and heroes. Do you not want your head to explode when you read that sentence? If you're not provoked, if you're not angered, you must ask yourself why. Because she has preached that abortion is a blessing and that providers are modern-day saints and heroes. A radical leftist, I would argue theologically heretical, promoter of abortion rights, attempting to trump it up as something religious and faith-based. It is an affront to our holy God. It is an affront to the one true church. Those of us who proclaim Christ as Lord and Savior is an affront to the word of God, and it is an affront to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that this woman would stand herself up as a religious leader heading an organization which wantonly, openly, promotes the slaughter of God's image bearers. What should our response be? Well, first, to be educated, which is why we provide this show. But second, to take action. Talk to your religious leaders about their view of abortion. Talk to them about what they're doing to end the greatest slaughter in American history, the American genocide. That's our show for today. Thanks for tuning in to The Human Element Show. For more information and a library of all the shows we've done, go to thehumanelementshow.com. If you'd like more information on Human Coalition, an organization committed to making abortion unthinkable and unavailable, go to humancoalition.org. That's humancoalition.org. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Brian E. Fisher, at Brian E. Fisher. And if you're on Instagram, you can check me out at fish at 10 a.m. for some personal pics and funny stories. I'm really glad you joined us today. We're going to continue to investigate cultural events and what's going on around us through a pro-life worldview. We'll see you next time. Joining us on The Human Element Show with Brian Fisher. For more information, visit thehumanelementshow.com or find out more about Human Coalition at humancoalition.org.